So we've heard your, your explanations of whether we can reduce life to a single set of rules and values, but let's dig a little bit deeper, it, specifically when it comes to the forces behind this. Does, I suppose the first one that I'm going to put to Sophie Grace is, does an objective morality exist that this, these rules could be based on? Well, um, I am an objectivist. I do believe that value is real. And I think value is there as part of the way that we live together and, and work together. I, I think it's part of the fabric of things. And I think things that often look very much like not values, for example, the notion of a fact, actually, these are, are deeply, I think, deeply normative notions. To say that something is a fact is to mark it as something that we can trust. And so in, in a sense, I mean, if I'm if I'm in a knockabout mood and, and why shouldn't I be? It's it's almost cocktail time. Um, I'm inclined to say, who cares about objectivity? Um, it's not that we're looking for some kind of cosmic, super existing, super world um, objective truth with a capital T, you know, which if if uh, Terry Gilliam was doing the the. Um, the graphics that be the words truth inscribed in stone rotating in empty star star studded space what we, that's not what we need even if it's there and i'm an objectivist so in a sense i do believe it's there but that's not what we need what we need is something that we can trust as the basis for our working together and living together we i, I think this is a kind of massive red herring we think we need to go up to the stars to bring objectivity down to earth but objectivity objective truth is already there and it consists in our ability to trust one another. And that's one, I think that's one of the, the products, the psychological products of having um, rules that we keep and are seen to keep. And I think this is where the idea of objectivity comes together with Simon's very interesting um, stress on empathy, because the link between the two is trust. Mm -hmm. It's behavior that we can trust, behavior patterns that we can rely on from each other. and. That also helps us with empathy, because if we know that people are, um, at least to some extent, predictable in the way they behave because they keep rules, then that helps us to see into their minds. Massimo, I suspect you will be in full, full agreement with, with this notion of uh, objectivity. <laughs> Actually, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I don't think there is such a thing as objective morality, if by that we mean what philosophers refer to as realism, that is, uh, the notion that there is a truth of the matter to uh, moral questions, that it's that moral questions are analogous to factual questions or to mathematical questions. I don't think that's the case. That was Kant's uh, uh, perspective, for instance. That's the perspective of most religions. And I, I, don't, I can't make sense of it. I don't know where those, uh, those truths would, would uh, come and how we would find out about those truths. However, the, the interesting part, uh, I think, for me is that just because there is no objective truth out there in terms of ethics, it doesn't mean that ethics is arbitrary. It doesn't mean that um, that anything goes, that your opinion is, again, is just as good as mine. Um, there is an intermediate position, which is often referred to is in um, moral philosophy as um, ethical naturalism. Ethical naturalism is the notion that uh, we need to step back for a minute, for a second, and, and ask ourselves: well, What is ethics anyway? What is the function of ethics or moral? Thing? By the way, I'm going to use throughout ethics and morality as synonyms. So, if anybody wants to make a distinction there, you're, they're welcome. But I'm going to use them as, as synonyms. And uh, you know, the question is: Well, where does that come from? Uh, it comes from the fact that we are we evolved as social animals, and we live. A, we need a, we need ways to live together, to cooperate, to function, uh, to regulate more or less our society, and not, not just us, but other social primates. And sure enough, as other social primates we've observed have developed the equivalent of what we would call uh, moral moral behaviors or ethical behaviors, and so that means that the point of ethics is in a in a especially in a, uh, advanced human society, meaning a society with language and, and uh, uh, a complex structure, civilization, et cetera, et cetera, is to maximize the chance that each one of us can uh, flourish. That is the point, right? Now, there are many, many different ways of doing that. There isn't what, just one answer. That, that's why I'm skeptical of rules. And there isn't, there isn't only one uh, specific way of going about it, which is why I don't think there is an absolute sense of, of morality. However, there is also a lot of things that don't work, a lot of things that, that undermine 
uh, human flourishing, and therefore those things are, in my book, unethical or immoral. So I guess what I'm saying is, no, there is no such thing as universal morality or objective morality, but there are very strong constraints that being a social animal of a particular kind with certain needs and certain uh, priorities and desires imposes on how we want to behave toward each other, which is, again, the kind of the problem that uh, ethics tries to solve. Uh, Simon, I want to bring you in, obviously, at this point. Um, where does the idea of empathy fit into this? Is, is empathy one of the uh, objective mor morals that we can refer to? Where does it fit into what our other panellists have been? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if the question is, um, does uh, an objective morality exist? Mm. Um, I think uh, I think I would sort of replace the word objective with the word universal. You know that what we're that often what we're trying to arrive at is a set of universal rules for how to treat one another, and you know that's kind of what we what we expect organizations like the United Nations to be there for, or the World Health Organization to be there for. And even if we go back to my earlier example about the Nuremberg Code of Ethics, you know they were trying to develop a code that could apply to any society at any time, not just now, but in the future, you know, of what counts as, as ethical, you know, and it, and it includes details about if you're, if you're dealing with patients or if you're dealing with, um, with, with participants in your research about getting consent and so forth. So trying to arrive at uh, things that everybody would agree on, which is what we, what we mean by universal. Mm -hmm. um, but where I think that even that is limited is that, um, you know, if you look at the workings of an ethics committee, and I have to put all of my research, human research through an ethics committee in my university, ethics committees don't just go through a tick box, you know, where they can say, well, this looks ethical, it passes all the tests. They sit and discuss, because it's the nuance of, you know, of the wording of your study or, the methods of your study, which are going to, you know, everything's going to turn on the detail and it needs discussion. The last point I was going to make about universal ethics, you know, it's, is it's probably kind of impossible because things change with time. So I can imagine that today animal experimenting is considered to be okay. Um, but I can imagine in the future, there'll be a time when animal experimentation will not be considered okay. And even more so because there are alternatives to animal experimentation. Uh, you know, science now has the opportunity to, to, to use so-called model systems, which do not involve hurting or sacrificing an animal to test, um, for example, if a drug might be useful for a particular organ. You know, we can imagine in the future that there'll be a ban on all animal testing. So, it, it changes with time, our concepts of what we might all agree, sitting around a, a table in an ethics committee, we might all agree this is ethical, it might be a function of what is available and how have attitudes changed over time. So on that note, I wanted to ask the, the whole panel, and of course, anyone feel free to jump in with regards to what anyone else has said about this idea of where we derive these objective truths from. I mean, obviously, Massimo doesn't think there are objective truths. And Simon, I sort of get the sense you're thinking they're more of an evolving set of what we might call universal truths. Um, so maybe Sophie Grace, do you, do you have, uh, you know, some insights for us on where do these objective morals come from? What is the reference point, if any, for, you know, ascertaining what they actually are? Well, I want to go back to uh, something that Massimo said, which is that um, if you didn't have some rules, then you wouldn't have a society at all. Um, so I would like to start, although, as I say, I, I am a point of view of the universe objectivist as well, I think the way to talk about this is not by starting there, because it's, it's just too difficult. I, I think, I, I'm also interested by Massimo, because um, Kant famously said two things fill me with wonder and awe, the more I reflect on them. One is the starry heavens above, and the other is the moral law within. And when Kant says that, he's drawing out a stoic theme 
And the Stoic theme is the contrast of order in the universe, the macrocosm, with order in the soul, the microcosm. And so in Stoicism, these two things go hand in hand. You have the objectivity out there, uh, the transcendent objectivity, and you also have the objectivity that comes from within, the imminent objectivity. So I was very struck that Massimo apparently doesn't have time for the transcendent objectivity. But what I do want to agree with Massimo about is this, that if we're going to discuss objectivity, then we don't need to worry, actually, with, with respect to Simon. I don't think we need to worry about the universal because we don't have to deal with every moral conflict there's ever been. Right now, we have to deal just with this moral conflict. And that's a matter of conversation and negotiation. And I think that when we negotiate with others, um, I'm thinking the kind of approach that Jürgen Habermas takes to ethics, it starts with dialogue. It starts with conversation. And with any luck, we will be able to negotiate terms out that we can agree to, give, to live together by. And I think that some of those terms that we will negotiate our way to will inevitably take the form of rules. I think rules will be part of what we get if we take that imminent approach to objectivity and we say, look, what can we thrash out together? How can we agree to live together? So I think one of the basic values that we'll have is indeed, as Simon's been saying, empathy. I think another is the thing I've been banging, about, tr banging on about, trust. And I think one thing, that trust really needs, and this brings us back to objectivity and truth, one thing trust really needs is the rule, do not tell lies. And when I look at the state of UK and US politics, and indeed Italian politics, um, the attractiveness of the rule, do not tell lies, especially in public life, especially if you're a journalist or a politician, don't tell lies. The attractiveness of, of that as a way of getting objectivity together, being able to live together, being able to negotiate, I think is is huge. If only people didn't tell lies. Well, but but in fact we do tell lies all the time for good reasons. I mean that was that's one of the standard objections about a Kantian uh you know universal rule against lying. Uh the the, yeah. the obvious example is well the Nazi officer knocks at my door, do I lie yeah. about him about yeah. hiding the Jew in the basement, right? So again that's another situation where the general framework is okay. Generally speaking, you don't want to lie, but you need to use your judgment in a specific case. Also, but whenever you, wanna... so, so whenever you've got um, refugees in your basement, Massimo, and whenever the Nazis are at the door, you do tell a lie then. Right, but, but then I broke the rule. What percentage of cases, what percentage of your cases is that? But that's the only one case. There are them. many other cases where I can do the same uh, for, uh -huh. in, a, in a more, you know, sort of less dramatic situation. Yeah. So then, then we have to sort of start agreeing on when is it acceptable, when it's not. And, and I think it gets complicated. As I said, as a general rule, that's okay. As a general sort of tends, ten, uh, ten, uh, tending to behave that way, that's okay. But I want to go back to um, your issue about transcendence and sort of universal objectivity. I, I think that was a little too fast. Um, you can't say, oh, well, let's set that aside. We don't want to talk <laughs> about that. We want the, the, to talk about what we need to do right now. Well, yeah, but what we need to do right now is informed by whatever transcendental view you may or may not have. So I think we do need to talk about it. And I reject the transcend any transcendental view because I think that morality is a human invention. It's, a, it's an evolutionary invention. Um, and that doesn't mean, as I said before, that it's arbitrary, that it's not constrained by a number of, of, of factors. Uh, so it's, it's not true that anything goes. But nevertheless, I reject anything that is transcendental. Yeah, you're right. The ancient Stoics believe in a, in a providential universe that was a living organism. But, you know, I have to go with modern science, uh, which tells me that, no, the universe is not a living organism mm -hmm. with, uh, endowed with providential powers. So I, I do think that that debate is interesting. I also want to ask about uh, to Simon because uh, th this thing because I was a little surprised about empathy. As you know, there are some of your colleagues in psychology, Paul Bloom, I think, for instance, at Yale, who are very skeptical of the use of yeah, yeah, yeah. empathy, right? And yeah. I think they have a point because yes, empathy is natural, and yes, you don't want a human being without empathy. That's a psychopath. Nevertheless. Because empathy is so based on, on uh, you know, sort of a emotional response that we have to certain situations, um, it, it's easy to manipulate people through, uh, through empathy. It's easy to convince yourself that you should be doing something because you have this gut feeling that that's the right thing. But it turns out upon reflection that maybe you shouldn't. 
And that is why in, in certain philosophical circles, at least, there's a shift from empathy to sympathy. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.